Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Creative Insider podcast number 56 with me, Georgi Leshtarsky. In this podcast episode, I had the pleasure to talk with the Lithuanian Argvis artist Milda Lubinskaita. Milda is an educated interior architect with professional experience in Lithuania and the Netherlands. She has started her career as an archivist, artist at Meccano Architects, and she's currently working at Plump. We have talked about her path into this career and her experience as a speaker at the State of Art Academy Days, one of the most popular events in the industry. And of course, we have talked of the role of women in this field. But before we start the conversation, I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. And I want to remind you that if you want to support us, you can do that for free by just subscribing to the platform you're listening to and by leaving a good review if that's possible. Another great way to support us is by spreading the word with your friends, colleagues, or family, and by following our social media channels, which are TCI Podcasts or the LinkedIn page, The Creative Insider. If you want to go a little deeper with the support, below in the description, you'll also find a link to Patreon, where you'll be able to support us with maybe just five bucks a month or the wish from you amount of money. And as soon as possible, we'll be creating also some perks for all of our patrons. But... For now, enough with the presentation and the introductions. I wish you a pleasure listening to the conversation with Milda Lubinskaita. The whole world stops just like that. Hello, Milda. How are you? Hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to have you on the podcast. Um, it uh, you. I when I approached you, you were a little skeptical because you didn't know about the the podcast so much. But I guess uh, now that you have listened also to a couple episodes, you're more relaxed. I think I was more surprised than skeptical because it was something I wouldn't expect. So caught me out of out of blue <laughs> oh it's um you know it's very interesting to to talk to different people and um now that i know that a couple of people that have been on the podcast are more like famous or accomplished within the architectural or creative creative world uh, people are like some some people say why are you asking me i'm like yeah because that's the whole purpose that those people come on the podcast so that they give some fame to the show and then i can invite uh, people that uh, i see are talented but not yet so famous maybe and give them you know platform to to skyrocket them hopefully and yeah uh, yeah and it's actually very nice i listened to several podcasts and uh, some of them actually were even colleagues of mine i think i counted even four or five people actually <laughs> um, I, I, I know that you have worked probably with um, uh, Federico Biancullo he worked at MV uh, no at Meccano and then exactly. uh, uh, Irgen Saliani also was on the podcast Ma Marina, Marina was the latest yes. and I don't know if you know anyone else I think I saw someone else who I knew but uh, I might be wrong <laughs> But uh, were you also on, did you participate also when they won the Varna Library competition? You were also working with them on that or no? No, no. I I actually never worked on any projects with them besides Meccano. So ah, okay. as we were colleagues in Meccano, that's that's all basically. Yeah. Okay, because I, I, I'm, I started uh, with uh, Federico because he is famous within the Italian scene because he has this famous blog for students in Italian. And then um, I, by accident, then I kind of contacted the others and I'm kind of reconstructing that team without even wanting it. And this is actually how my social media showed me you somehow. And then I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then I was really, really interested to talk with someone from Lithuania 
because um, as I was telling you before the conversation, I have a, a now former colleague, but a very good friend from Lithuania. And um, he did he he didn't want to to participate because uh, for for the same for the same reason you in the beginning you were uh, surprised he was like ah, I don't have anything to say although he has and uh, uh, I was like okay man like I I found uh, another Lithuanian guest so f you <laughs> we're gonna have someone else and no it was he's always welcome to come if he ever wants to. Um, but let's start from the beginning of your story. I'm very curious to discover the whole the whole story. Um, and I start always with this question. Was there like a, a moment in your life or I don't know, someone from your family? Uh, how did you come up with the idea to become a creative person? Uh, I don't know, I guess you're educated as an architect, a designer. Yeah, so... Uh... I actually come from a mathematician's family. My dad was a professor in university. My mom, IT programmer. My sister is economist. So for them was completely surprising that I wanted to do something with art. And uh, I think the first idea I got when I was in sixth grade, so what is it, like 12, 13 years old, uh, that I wanted to study interior design. And that's basically where the the, the story starts because uh, to study in Lithuania in the art academy, you have to prepare well for the exams. So I just went to art school uh, for four years and then three years just before uh, the exams in the art academy, I did a lot of, of painting and uh, drawing, uh, composition studies. And then there was the exam. So, so yeah, I studied interior design in Lithuania. Uh, and I, why I studied interior? Because I thought that it's more, for me, it was like architecture from inside. So I wanted to, to do architecture and already build structures. And for me, this was very interesting. But at the same time, um, I saw that most of people look at interior designers as pillow uh, selectors and uh, carpet color selectors. Sub, <laughs> sub architect. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's I don't know. In general, architects are a little douchey, and um, this is why um, I want to do this kind of podcast with this kind of tone. You know, that's more colloquial, because uh, you get always this I don't know meetings uh, on these uh, lectures or uh, conversations which are like round tables where everybody gets really douchey. And uh, I, I like to show, and, and I don't know, I think that the job is not douchey at all because it's very dynamic and it's very... Um... No, I think so too. And at the end, you know, uh, we are trained as an architect. It's just we often work within the structure already given, you know. But uh, in, the first, uh, in the first course, we even have to design the house with all the electricity and piping and everything, or at least in Lithuania. Um, but I think in general, my story with rendering started when I was already uh, studying because we we were working with this program, Archicad, and it was very, uh, I mean, it's a great program, but uh, it's hard to be creative in it. At least what was to almost 20 years, no, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Uh, so if you wanted some fancy forms, it was very limited at that point. <clears throat> so uh, me and my boyfriend, now husband, uh, at that time, we decided to uh, study Max just after university. You know, we had a guy who would come to our house and teach us how to model, how to render. Uh, and I think that was the, the first time when when I got into this idea that it's nice to present it nicely. Because it's not only about the idea, but as well how you present it. We have, um, I have had, um, um, this is a very nice thing because I can tell you also something that I think about it. 
um when i was studying also i had to do a project uh, which was in groups and i i got to work with uh, one uh, spanish uh, student that was in erasmus at my home university and um i was a newbie back then and nobody teaches you you know stuff how to do them how to make plants look cool and um he he told me a lot about how to do nice uh, drawings uh, any kind of also perspectives and things and uh, also some renderings and uh, he had this way of saying like um if you have a bad project but it's um it's it's a bad project but it's uh, nicely presented nicely drawn it's like uh, those uh, good looking girls with bad characters uh you 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 know that they have a bad character but you still like them <laughs> i mean it can be reversed with boys for girls but yeah so so i guess uh, this is really true i mean also nowadays yeah it, it might be but i still feel that good architecture which would be portrayed badly it loses a lot so i think everyone should well, not only architecture in general, any product and anything. So I, I think it's just, uh, it's nice to make world nicer. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, I mean, um, unfortunately, when it's professional, then it sometimes involves money and uh, architects don't want to spend time, which is money on that. And uh, it gets more like practical. But, uh, but yeah, I agree with you. And um, you said you studied in a, first in an art school and then in the art academy you studied interior, right? Yeah, so that was bachelor, uh, bachelor. interior design. But uh, w w you have like specific art school in, in Lithuania. Where are you from actually from Lithuania? Are you from the capital? I'm from, yeah, I'm from Vilnius, uh, but are you talking about art academy or art school? No, because, um, you know, art, art school, it's like your regular school was already focused on arts or how did, or that was something extra you were doing while studying? Yes, that's correct. So uh, I was just going to school and after school, uh, free, actually six days a week. Three hours after school, I would paint, draw, or do a composition. And then after that, you come back around nine o'clock in the evening, you do your uh, normal studies and then, uh, and then go to sleep. So yeah, it was, it was tough, tough times. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I was asking about that because for example, myself, I have studied in a school of arts, but that was like already integrated in the school, you know, like it was a school that you were learning regular things and then you would have just way more hours where you have in the first two years you have painting you do pottery you do some principles of mm. geometry and geometrical drawings and then you can then choose i choose architecture and and uh it's called it was called back in the days architecture and like furniture design and then after that i accessed university and so you studied interior. It's in Lithuania. You learn Lithuanian. Uh, you learn like design, interior design directly at the uh, art academy, or is that, that not is in correct, the, yes. Okay. And then so you you finished all of that, and you learn Max with um, your partner. And uh, at what point uh, you? How did you? Did you already transition in Lithuania to be a professional somehow, or you moved abroad? What was yeah, so I think it was more or less, I graduated in 2010, I think. So, yeah, then we started looking for a job and it was after crisis times, which wasn't very easy. So uh, <laughs> we actually worked in this little company of five people, architectural company. They mostly were doing... Uh, private housing in, I think, Belarus. Uh, so we were just working there. They were paying us cash in dollars. <laughs> and that was basically the moment you realize this is not going to last long and it shouldn't. So it should be something else. Uh, so I started looking for master studies. 
uh, in Europe. I just felt I needed to go abroad to to get different experience. Um, I got few options, and at the end, I chose Netherlands because. The studies are not that expensive, and uh, you can work next to it to to maintain the, you know, to pay the rent and buy some food. <laughs> yeah, actually, Ma Marina was already mentioning that that uh, you have the opportunity to work, and so you. I mean, here in Germany, it's the same thing, and um, that's how it works because I'm based in Germany in Frankfurt. I arrived here as a Erasmus student, and after four months, I learned some basics of German and then um, I figured out this internship in the architecture office and that was really helpful for me professionally and also like to really you know maintain yourself like pay your bills uh, you cannot live uh, the very wealthy life as a student but still you can be a decent no no but it's yeah exactly it's decent like something you can completely <laughs> yeah, I mean, from. for for I'm originally from Bulgaria, so uh, for for us that are uh, original from Eastern European countries, uh, it's uh, of course it's really really okay. So it's uh, we can adapt. I like that uh, that we're adaptable. In, uh, yeah, we don't have this super high expectation, and we can sacrifice. Um, you know, prioritize. Say, okay, I'm gonna struggle a couple of years, but then I'm gonna. Um, have a better job. And where did you study in the Netherlands? So in the Netherlands, I studied interior architecture in Pietzwart uh, Academy, which belongs to Rotterdam High uh, School. Uh, the, this was uh, two years English program, uh, but it was very, uh, I would say, versatile uh, because we were was interior architecture, but at the same time we were doing as well uh, pro product design and um, having different classes with the product design. We went uh, to Milan Design Week, so every year uh, first course of students would go to Milan Design Week, which was amazing experience, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, in Lithuania is more, when you study in Lithuania, you, you get more to design so it's it's not mainly the the idea you have to sell but you have to show something nice and uh, it's it's a craftsmanship basically when uh, in netherlands you always start with the idea and this how to prove that your idea works at the end they don't care how the project looks it's more if you have a good idea and you can communicate it so uh I'm actually very grateful that I had the opportunity to try both and combine these both uh, types of studies in my life because I think it gave me a lot. But you mean by that that in the Netherlands was something more like conceptual, like something more, um, I mean, that you have to create with your interior some sort of uh, experience or some sort of... Uh, um, yeah, I would say more an experience rather than pure, cool, slick design, or um, and in exactly okay, and um, I would say more. I'm sorry. No, no, yeah, keep keep going. Uh, I would say more uh, research based. So, for example, my graduation project was we had we had just one location we, because we're based in in Rotterdam, so it's a port city and uh, the location was port and from there you can go anywhere that's your graduation topic so uh, because um, i'm in love with concrete <laughs> and port is basically made of concrete so i just dig the concrete topic till the end and uh, at the end i just create I, I didn't even know how to put it i knew the topic but i didn't know what is going to be the final uh, product of the project. And I, because of the research and the methodology, I ended up creating a concrete brick, which could be used anywhere, interior, exterior, for uh, highway ba uh, barriers, something like that. So th that's what I liked about those studies, that you, 
you do the research before you know what happens at the end. <laughs> so. And um, when you when you moved abroad, I'm uh, curious, like when you moved to the Netherlands, um, did you have any cultural shock when moving there? Like, um, I mean, your studies were in English, so I guess they were very international. But like uh, the life, your life that you had uh, in the like the life, not the lifestyle, but I mean, the when you're used to live somewhere, you're also used to the people and to the, you know, local culture so to say and when you moved to the netherlands was there something that uh, shocked you also like in in both uh, like your professional academical life and private life how was that experience no i, I wouldn't say there was any cultural shock i mean of course it is different but uh, at the same time like I, I visited uh, foreign countries before, you know, so so it wasn't something completely new. Um, of course, people are different. Uh, Dutch people are, uh, we laugh that they are brutally honest because they say straight in your face, you like it or not. Uh, but it's, in a way, it's a good thing because it's, uh, you learn to take the criticism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's true it's like um i mean i'm i've always lived between two countries because i'm from bulgaria but i grew up grew up in italy and uh but still when i came to germany it was a little bit of a culture shock for me because um you know the the local culture is way different than these other two countries and uh also here people are like really honest and i was like that's so rude but then i understood that they don't do it with uh, like in a mean way they just like oh uh i don't have time to meet you <laughs> this is something that a german person <laughs> could say <laughs> and they will be like oh my god because they, if they say they, they're gonna meet you they actually will do it and if they say yes but they don't do it that's um yeah it's a disaster and um how did you manage with your with your partner did he follow uh yes that is correct actually he then studied in the same university he just joined a year later oh. so. but uh yeah but before so we met in art academy when i was studying interior design he was studying architecture uh and i think the school as well changed him because he's not doing architecture well not practicing let's put it that way so he went more to product design and art and yeah and uh, so i think that university changes <laughs> yeah i mean it's yeah it's it, i think it's important to be flexible uh with you know because people get too attached to what they what they do what they are and sometimes that might be a problem because I don't know, maybe you don't find a job in what you do or maybe what you wanted to do, it's not exactly what you imagine it is. So you need to disrupt yourself a little bit and be like, there is other things that I can do and they're different. And it's, I don't know, I think it's uh, it's scary. For, I mean, for me personally, also it would be scary, you know, sometimes if I think tomorrow I wake up and somebody says, you know, you need to start over somewhere else in something else, it's difficult. Um, and uh, what did you did you also start uh, in, in architecture internship while studying, or if you first did regular jobs, and then how how was your professional career starting in the Netherlands? Uh, so while studying, I didn't have any job related with career. Like uh, I was just working in the kitchen washing dishes, <laughs> uh, but, which was, you know, no brainer work. You just get the money. And uh, the thing is in Netherlands, you, you can get the subsidy, but when you're a foreigner, you can get the subsidy from the government only when you work, when you are a working student, because Dutch people can get the subsidy without working, but foreigners have to work. Um, so, so yeah, uh, when I graduated, I applied to several companies, but one of my uh, tutors was 
uh, well, actually, they both at the point worked at Meccano, but one was already uh, away and the other one was still working there. So I applied, I applied, I think, twice to Meccano. And then the second time I applied, he, he texted me personally, said, I think we have one project where you could fit very well. So I, I will try to make sure you get the interview for for that. Uh, it was internship, not any different position. So I went there. It was a uh, uh, multicultural project, I think maybe library in Norway. Um, and we worked with small team, like six people. Half of them were Spanish, half Dutch. We had amazing time together. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, Macan is huge company. It's, it, at that point, it was like 150 people or something. So you don't even know all the bosses, let's put it that way. Like, you know them, but you don't. Um, and uh, every six, year, uh, six months, they would review who stays after internship and who doesn't. So I got a call that uh, they are not extending my contract. I was like, okay, I didn't expect that, but I guess that's life, no? <clears throat> so uh, uh, at that time, I was working with another girl on the competition in the UK. And I just asked uh, for extra two days to finish the competition because I felt it's a bit unfair to leave people in between the work when I couldn't finish the work. <clears throat> so we finished that competition. I had my goodbye party. And one of the partners goes to this colleague of mine and asks, uh, so who did the images? And she's like, what, don't you know? It was Milda who did the images. And then he, he was like, but where is she now? And she's like, well, you didn't extend her contract. <laughs> and, uh, and then I got a call from Nakano, like in two days or something. Um, suggesting me to come for the position as a uh, visualizer. And they never had one before. Basically, who, who could visualize, they did visuals, but that's, that was about it. And uh, they just created me a position. But that's so, like, when I, it's, it's nice to hear these stories because um, when I was, uh, you know, also, like, um, when I was studying and I wanted to find a job, I just found a job in here and the company wasn't something, you know, worldwide renowned because also, I mean, Frankfurt is probably not the city where you have these offices, which are like, at, at the, let's say like the, the Dutch offices are really, really famous all around the architectural world. And when I wanted, I wanted to go there, but at the same time, you know, for me, it wouldn't have been really possible because here I could study and finish my uh, exams and that would have been, you know, a big mess. But also, like, I, I don't know. I don't like that now that I hear these stories, it feels like uh, they're a little bit using their name to, you know, make you this... Because if you do an internship there, then it's, um, of course, valuable for your CV. But I don't know if, like... I don't know if it's the, I don't know, you can tell me, like, you have to a little bit, after something like that's happened, you need to put your ego in check and be like, okay, whatever, they made, they, they made a mistake. Uh, I don't know, how did you feel about it? Because I would have felt like, okay, now you need me, like, why didn't you just be more... I mean, I mean of course, at the beginning it was a bit weird, like, you know how I work, or at least if I work well, why it doesn't go to the correct people, you know? Why Why at the end they terminated my contract and then changed their mind when they realized that I'm a bit more valuable than they thought. But I think this is just the industry, you know? They recycle people. I mean, it's, you get student who just graduated, you pay a little money. After six months, you get another one. You know, you, you don't need to sign contracts after for, you know, the longer periods or something like that. So it, Rotterdam is architect city. Like, 
I don't know, you meet people when you could go to the bars, you meet people in the bars. Every second person is an architect and they all worked in, you know, in that company, in that company, in that. It's a rotation yes, going yes. on. So uh, is, it, is it good? I don't know. Maybe, you know, you, you learn different things in different companies, that's for sure. I mean, Makanov for me was an amazing place to work. Um, maybe it hurt, but I, I forgot it quite fast. And uh, really, at the end, I spent there, I think, five years. Uh, it was an amazing time. I made uh, best friends there, and uh, we still are friends till, till now. It's only good memories. Yeah, of course. I, I, it's nothing uh, to be related with, uh, you know, the people you work with, because no matter where you go, you work with people. And uh, um, I mean, maybe you won't become friends with everybody, but you find for sure people that you enjoy working with, that you can spend also sometimes after work with and things like that, especially if like the age range is not too different and it's like you have completely different lifestyles I, I think because I mean you can get friends with also someone that's older but I mean sometimes people have just different lifestyles if they have family kids and all that things um, yeah, but I'm curious like uh, okay like what is we said that's you learned a lot and you had a great experience but it, it may be hurt so I want to know what was like the painful part uh, Oh, but first, tell me what what like what was that you learned? Because uh, yeah, I'm curious. Like uh, what you think you learn a lot there, and what um, what was hurt painful? No, so so the painful part was that story I just told. That uh, you oh, know, okay, that was the painful the, part. Ex exactly, exactly. But uh, what what I learned? I mean, when I got suggested this. Uh, uh, visualizing position i wasn't sure that it's the way i'm gonna go because at the end they um, they would still look at me as interior architect who can do visuals so i would work on uh, very cool projects like uh, one of the longest ones was martin luther king library in uh, washington dc as well, uh, New York Public Library in Fifth Avenue. So uh, this Washington DC library I worked on for three years, I think. And it wasn't all, I mean, I, I did tons of visuals for it, uh, but the visuals was on purpose to design the interior. So, so it was a bit of uh, working, because I feel like, especially in America, clients want more and more visuals instead of detailed plans because it's just easier to understand and uh, you know you can already know the color and you can work on the detailing in the in the 3d so so you know you, you get everything so i was doing even images for entrance rubber mats how it's integrated in the marble you know like these kind of things so so in that case, I would say I learned a lot because I like before for me, uh, renders was just the way to to explain my project. But uh, basically in Makano, I started to think that this could be uh, the main thing I want to do and uh, continue further in the life. Yeah, I mean, I think it's obvious like for for like client communication that's in my opinion it's the best uh, the best uh, medium because uh, the clients they're usually not um, people who are architects sometimes they have consultancy from other architects which tell them if it's good or not but in the end of the day regular people that are not architects i call them regular people <laughs> as architects are not but uh yeah they want to see what i'm gonna get what is my it's like when you're buying a car you don't ask how they build a car you just pick you know the leather tires the the the, the color so you, you it's, yeah so i think it's definitely definitely the best the best medium 
uh, but at least when they rehired you in this position, did they give you like a, a, a like and that like um, what was the contract? Was it ready for a certain time, or was it like okay now you're like here fix? <laughs> Uh, no, in in Netherlands, uh, by law, you can uh, you can give uh, contracts for six months. I think for three or two years. I don't remember now. So so yeah, every time I would get a contract for six months, and then it would be extended, and then at the very end, I got a fixed contract, which was un undetermined. Uh, and I think after three months, I said that I'm leaving then. <laughs> so, the, you know, when you get something you are seeking for, you get it and then you decide that, oh, maybe. But it took, too, it, it took so long, damn, like you worked there five years to get this contract. Because uh, here in Germany, you have like uh, the possibility to do two years, like you say one year, one more year, and then... Yeah. And then, yeah. But yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm counting those six, uh, five years. It wasn't exactly five. I think it was like four and a bit. So, but this I count with uh, internship. So this basically doesn't count. Mm -hmm. And then because they were hired. So, yeah, it's, I think it's very similar to the German. And I'm, I'm curious, just like out of curiosity, when, like, I mean, you said the internship wasn't really well paid. But when you get hired, like uh, for this, like limited contracts, is a little uh, at least the paycheck enough to make you live, um, you know, a comfortable a comfortable uh, life in R R Rotterdam. You were based, I guess. Yeah, uh, don't recall exactly, but it's. It's decent, but it's not too much. Like you, you don't save too much at the end of the month because when you pay rent and maybe you go out and things like that. So, so yeah, maybe go one or two times on holiday and that's it. Yeah, it's not. Uh, basically, I was paid like a junior architect. So, yeah, same. I see. I see. But um, as someone that it's there do you have any idea or any personal opinion why why is by accident that rotterdam has become this hub of these offices or is the university there because for example silicon valley they say okay here is silicon valley because there are this all these universities that are there like uh University of California, the Stanford, uh, the Caltech, you know, and so this university pump really like out these tech geniuses. And of course, when they're going to settle somewhere, they just settle there because also their companies gonna um, like need people that are from these universities. And so it's like, a, you know, like a hub, a high. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, you know, to Delft is very known school. It's one of the best technical universities. Uh, and another thing that Rotterdam was completely demolished during Second World War. So probably it's one of those few cities in in Netherlands where architects can go crazy. And that's what they do. So, so I think this is <laughs> one of the main reasons, you know, because they can they can build a lot and they can build it the center, not like, uh, you know, in Amsterdam, you can't. Yeah, yeah. But prote protected city center. And things. What I've been always envy of the, of the Dutch uh, culture is that also their clients like to go crazy because here, uh, no matter, like here, the whole country was destroyed, but um, usually the developers, the clients, they're like really like they've been doing this for a long time now so when they see a crazy project they already know where the costs need to explode will explode because um in germany the standards are really really high of the building quality and of the building uh, security and safety so they will always go with the box uh boxy solution um, yeah absolutely i mean i don't work on many uh, dutch projects per se 
as uh, uh, architect. But because uh, most of my projects were in US and you know, US is like double whatever safety is happening in, in European Union. <clears throat> so, so yeah, I, I would say for Dutch architects, it's harder to take that into account because every time, you know, you do certain railing, it's like, okay, this is not by the regulation, so you have to change. And uh, yeah, just learn <laughs> what's happening in the country and then try to adjust it. Yeah. Um, one thing that was interesting to me when I contacted you to be on the on the podcast um, was that I uh, saw that you have been a speaker on the Academy Days of the State of Arts State of Art Academy, which is in northern of Italy. And then when then I further on researched a little bit on your background, I saw that you have uh, completed yourself that. Um, that master class, right? Um, yeah, that's correct. Uh, so it was the time when, uh, <clears throat> so so because I was working mostly on a few big projects, so those libraries in Nakano, we realized that uh, there's much more projects which needs to be, uh, you know, visualized. So, so the capacity is not enough and uh, and then we hired Federico as uh, to do more like competition renders and things like that because I was still not. I kind of liked my position being in between design and visuals, so I didn't want to completely dive into just visualization. Let's say at that point. So uh, then Federico joined, uh, and there was another guy in. Nakano T1 office. We had like several people working there, <clears throat> and he he was as well into doing visuals for the projects Nakano projects in Taiwan. And uh, I don't remember who suggested. I think it was Federico or 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 uh, William Yu that maybe we should go to improve our skills to State of Art Academy masterclass um so actually Makano was very nice and they they sent us there so we uh, uh we we got a bit funded for for the master class yes yeah this was was uh this is what i was curious about because um i got to know this uh academy through you know social media or just through following when you start following people that are into the in the field and you discover like it's a little bit like the Hansel and Gretel you know like there are like these pieces of bread that you, <laughs> you pick and you discover things and um, <laughs> at some point I also was thinking about because I really like architectural representation um, and I was thinking to attending the class but like um, I don't know at when when I checked the last time it was um, around Five thousand euros to attend a master class for something maybe, and then you, the the whole problem was not only about the money, but it was also because that you need to go one month there um, and be there. So uh, that that was like this is was. Uh, but now that you said that Meccano sent you, it's like make way more sense. Which absolutely, but. Uh, uh, I mean, for Macan as well, they needed to think if it's worth for them to pay, because you know it's uh, <laughs> it's not that little money. Uh, I, I, I'm sure for time, them it's I'll... not a lot of money. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I was thinking if they say no, I probably would try to go on my own money. I I just thought it's worth uh, investing in myself and. Uh, I would say after the class, I would absolutely go again. I mean, it was amazing, amazing to meet those people, uh, what we've learned there as well, the students, some of them became one of my best friends, you know? So I think it's it's very awesome what they're doing and they're doing a really good job. 
now I just checked. So for the matter of being fair, mm, currently I'm I'm checking that uh, maybe because it's online, the Italian version of the master class, which is in Italian, it's three thousand nine hundred thirty euros, and uh, I guess the English might be the same, or slightly different. But we're I think that, it's the same. yeah, so it's it's that range. I mean, uh, so that I mean, I don't want that to say false things but it's yeah i mean it, back in the days when i was a student and i wanted to do that it was a lot of money it would, it would have been all my savings right away on this yeah, on, absolutely, on, absolutely. On, on this class and also you know you need to i don't know in that case maybe ask for a non it's it's a lot of money it's like yeah i said five thousand maybe because you have to pay this class but if you're keeping your house wherever you base your rent you need to pay still rent in that bond and then you need to pay a rent in Italy and you need to live in Italy. So it's like, I mean, in the end of the day, you really need around six, maybe, <laughs> to, to be sure that you're going to be... No, I, th I think a bit less because uh, I think uh, that they suggest where you can uh, live for, for uh, that month. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's around like 600 euros. And the food in Italy, you know, it's super good and super cheap. So yes, yes, of course. <laughs> no, no, I mean, yeah, I, I read that already in the website that they suggest you where to go and uh, um, yeah, so it's. But how about like, uh, did you need to, to have a car to go attend the class, or was right next to the academy? No, no, it was close to academy, so basically, you can go by foot easily, and. Uh, 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 to Venice, I think by train you can get in uh, maybe 30 minutes or something like that. So it was nice in the weekends to go to Venice and was still, I think, uh, Architectural Biennale that year we went. So it, I really had a blast. Like for me, this was, you're learning a lot because uh, you spend like eight or nine hours every day by the computer. Uh, at the point where you know the, your brain feels like uh, the burning uh but it still felt like holiday because it was just good weather good food nice people and uh yeah you do what you like so it was uh, absolutely worth it and i suggest if if someone wants to uh improve their skills i think it's a place to go and i think that was the course which put in my mind the idea that maybe I could be full-time architectural visualization. But I'm curious, okay, you, you went there and you were like not, you weren't starting from zero. You had already um, experience because you have been doing that uh, before you went there for at least a couple of years, if we exclude, probably you've done it also during your whole studies. So you were... Mm, for sure ad advanced so to say so i'm curious um if if it were someone that's completely new in the industry like never touched 3ds max before uh, is this thing um useful and in in your case if it was useful for you to you know i don't know structure your workflow somehow or to learn some something some little nuances that were different yeah absolutely so i think uh i think everyone in our class were uh, they knew max in one way or the other so everybody worked already in industry or closely related to that so i think I think they even ask you to, like, if you're completely new, I think they suggest you some tutorials to to learn yourself before going there. Because you need to to know Max a bit. And, you, you know, Max is not an uh, intuitive program, so uh, <laughs> you need some time to, to get used a bit in the space. Um, what was the other question? <laughs> what was, how was helpful for you? Like doing this class uh, as okay. someone that's um, already advanced and what was the takeaway from you, for you? Yeah, I, I mean, at the, at the end for me, 
you know, I did those classes when I was a student back in Lithuania, but it was more about modeling. And uh, at that time, it was mental ray, I think, rendering. So the rest, what I've learned in Meccano was uh, basically on my own. You know, like I, I had, I had a, a mentor there, but that was about it. Like I had to find my own ways how to do things. And this was basically the first time I had someone uh, who knows what they're doing and putting certain structure in the way. And it just, for me, it felt like connecting the dots a bit. So uh, I think it changed my workflow for sure, for, for the better, for the faster uh, and better results. Yeah, like when you get this aha moment, like, oh, yeah, now I've, uh, I realize what that button is there. <laughs> or I realize what is before, like, the steps. I mean, at the end, you know, they are doing um, uh, a lot of tutorials, for example, on the forest pack. And this is something, uh, you know, when you have it at work, you just try to play with it. But they have a connection with those people who are, <clears throat> I'm sorry, creating uh, the program. So, you know, they get uh, tutorials 101 straight away and they can explain to students better than what you would try to learn yourself playing around. So I think it's just, you know, like anything, when you have some structure and you know how to tell tell it to other people, you you can learn tons, tons for sure. Yeah, and it's also, you know, matter of, as you said, bringing some order in, in, uh, yeah, in your workflow. And um, how was it to be back as a, so the, for the people who don't know, um, I am not sponsored to say that. I'm just know that this is sort of an established course within dark this industry and the state of art academy does something that's called academy days where they invite i don't know people within the industry to i guess speak on um some specific topic i i don't know like i've never attended because i'm not in the industry and this is why i'm so uh also when people come on my podcast from the art uh, industries they're kind of happy because I'm really neutral and I don't, uh, you know, I don't take parts or I don't have bias question. Um, so how how did they contacted you and what was your topic of your speech of your speech or lesson or class you gave on this academy day? Uh, so I was contacted by Jim Piero, uh, one of one of the State of Art Academy people. Um, and he just told me like he would love to see me in Academy Days. And for me, it was super surprising because as well, uh, you know, like you invited me to a podcast and I said, but I, I don't know what I, what can I tell? Like, I'm, like there's so many big fishes in, in the sea, you know, why, why, why do you contact me? Because um, you're a bigger fish think, than you think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think... And what is, uh, you know, what we are trying to do to get more women uh, in the industry or not to get, maybe it's the wrong word, but to be, uh, to expose it more that it's, uh, it's the women friendly industry, you know? Um, so I think, uh, I think he just wanted to, to sh for me to present uh, and to show that, you know, step by step, you, you, you can just at the end achieve something you want. And, uh, you know, you, sometimes you can't plan what's going to happen, but it, it just happens. And, uh, well, I, I was for sure surprised and um, very grateful to be, uh, to be part of the Academy Days, especially between all those people who, who were amazing and, you know, you can always learn awesome stuff from them. But, but did you... So, so yeah, and uh, my, my topic... Like yeah. your, your topic was like about how you in, entered the industry or... Yeah, exactly. So my, my little story, you know, how from 
interior designer, I became a visualizer. So yeah. I'm um I I think it's interesting um and um I don't know how how is your personal experience because um now everywhere where I have worked um I didn't see here in Germany for example uh such a big majority of uh males in compared to females actually here in Germany I work in an office where most of the architects were females um so I don't know so far what is your your, your experience because um um that's something interesting to me I think I don't know I'm really curious to discover this topic also with people who are working and who are female because um now this is you know the topic of the of our time I guess like a little bit more like uh you know gender equality and um and um being i don't know equal equal opportunities and um for me it's interesting because um i'm someone that i've n never you know i know that's not the case for everyone but for me it doesn't really matter like if i see a, a woman in front of me and we're working i don't have any biases like i don't think oh she's stupid because she's a woman or uh but, i mean this is like what's the point you know like uh people people might think that uh actually i have had a lot of uh, bosses which were female and worked way better than if i had a male boss um and again i say that it's not the case and um i think that uh, yeah that the equality that it's it's seeking so to say it must be mainly decided on a some sort of um political level or like to say okay you're not allowed to you know i mean it's very complicated because you can pay two ma two male people or two female people which have the same position differently because they just have different character uh and i think some people are more agreeable some people are not agreeable um and you know it's a very it's a very broad topic it's very like complicated to say equality also because then there will be like equality uh maybe there won't be equality of asian female people in like i don't know african female people so it's like gets a lot of mess i think um i get the point like the point is to be like fair fairness um so i was like curious how, how is on your point of view like what why it's like friendly female friendly and i don't know what I mean, you can say maybe something that you already explained in your talk or what is your point of view i mean it's it's hard to say because i mean in a way uh you know my mom was very career woman so she was pushing me and my sister to you know to to be career women as well <laughs> let's put it that way um but she always told us you know when uh when you work you have to because you're a female you might need to work a little bit harder because there might you know men in the room but it's it's an old an old thinking maybe i don't know but at the same time i think it it helped me to think that you know if i want to to reach something i just have to work and uh, i'm gonna work as hard as possible so i wouldn't say i felt any inequality in my life because i'm a female or something uh, or at least i can't remember uh in architecture i agree with you there's i would say more or less similar amount of women than men and uh, especially Makano was i think at the point 50-50 plus ceo is uh, is female so so you know in architecture for sure you didn't see that i think the only time when i started going to the conferences of uh, architectural visualization that's when i started noticing that uh, okay being female is a bit uh, rare here <laughs> so i think the first one i went uh, from 330 people or so was 13 girls 
attending. So it, you could notice that difference. But I think now every year it's getting better and better. I have no idea why, why there is more men. Maybe because it's so... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of gamers in the industry. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe because there's more men men gaming than girls. I, I don't know. It's hard to say. But I, I don't think it's any different from any other work. You know, like in architecture, you as well work with the computer. So it's, it is a science, you know. <laughs> but for example, in my experience, for example, interior architecture, it's something that's probably female predominant. Or am I wrong? What is your experience? Like it's, it's, Absolutely. I don't know. It's really weird. I'm, like, I'm really curious to explore these things because I don't know if it's like, it's, um, I don't think it's like something, uh, social decided or somehow, I don't know. I don't, I, I think it's people just, I don't know, gra gravitate towards certain things. I don't know. I think, I think it's a bit still society pushed because interior you know like i said at the end you know some people look at you as uh, the one who picks the color of the wall and the pillow on the sofa uh, so it's more aesthetical maybe that's why more women go there but i mean i know so many so many men who are so as well with a high aesthetic level uh, taste and they do amazing stuff. So I don't think any job should be separated by gender in any case. Yeah, no, I, I don't think so too. But I think that there is some like maybe it's just by random uh, interest that some fields become predominant in one way or the other. Uh, and this is without, you know, for example, for me also like um, gaming, for example, also what you mentioned, it was like, I don't know, uh, very dominant on the male side. And then now there is all this streaming thing. People are streaming on Twitch and you can earn money. And then now there are these girl uh, gamers and they're getting more and more. And actually they're way more popular because they have actually an advantage. They look good and they, gave up, uh, they play a game. It's like, it is what it is. I'm just being like straight, straight up on it. It's like, it's... Um, um um yeah it is what it is and then like for example because i personally um you know like uh, i had uh, i had girls on on this podcast and um uh i i started uh, first time i mentioned this topic was mariana cabogueira she's um, an employee at zahadid architects she's a designer there she's a head of a team and we started talking about it and she's like, yeah, I noticed that when you invited me, I noticed that there are less females than males. And I'm like, yeah, just because, I mean, if I invite people and they say, no, I cannot do anything about it. I just need to have someone every Monday. So it's just, uh, you know, like, it's by accident. So may, but, may, but maybe what you're saying is right, that we, female are usually more careful and they, they you know, shy maybe that's why but i don't know i mean it's it's hard to say yeah no i mean I, the thing it's online so it's so it's really really like you can every time leave the conversation so it's like <laughs> on that point of view it's really safe and uh it's never like it's really uh really professional and um so it's uh, no i mean like because this thing i think I don't know I, what I, I I'm very much for for you know um, fairness. I'm, I'm really uh, for that, like because uh, you know people like when they mail, they, like they say, yeah, whatever the female, what they complain about. But tomorrow you have a daughter, or it's the same thing when you say, ah, oh, these gay people, or these transgender people. And tomorrow your kid might be that, and what you gonna do then? You, you need to have fairness for everybody. But what I don't like is like when it's pushed, like also with the change of language, like uh, you need to have a zer, uh, no, them, like, I don't know, people putting on social media, uh, she, uh, I'm she, her, I'm he, him, you know, like that's just, for me, it's like weird. It's like, uh, yeah, we're not focusing on the problem. We're just putting some, I don't know, 
new language and stuff like that. So this is for me weird. And um, yeah, I want to talk to to different people and like if uh, if somebody that's very you know that's very interesting to me to talk to and it's gay, I'm gonna invite them over. I don't care. Like I really don't care if they're like no, I really don't care. And this is what it's like. And I'm really proud to have like so many people from different countries. Like uh, for me, it's even more interesting to talk to people who are from different countries because they will have uh, a different point of view and different background. And it's also talking to different people. It's it's different the talk, you know, like we, when you have someone that's from, yeah, absolutely. from Denmark, it's completely different the way he comes over as someone from Brazil or... So it's it's really I think it's nice. I think uh, people should be loving differences and instead of you know just yeah absolutely. I remember I think it was <clears throat> uh, not <clears throat> I'm sorry um, not this state of art academy days but previous one and there was a huge complaining that they have speakers only men and the organizers were like okay guys but if we invite few females and they say no what shall we do so it's exactly you know your stories like if i invite and somebody says no what, what should i do should i then push uh, just for the number i mean yes. no because at the end you know i i want you to know me for what i do not for my gender you know yeah and uh, well in this case i i happen to to be a woman so okay i i just try to say that you know this uh, this field is not scary <laughs> girls don't be shy <laughs> try it it's super nice no i have seen that also there is on facebook the group uh, fem fem uh female in archivists or something like that uh or we women in archivists mm -hmm. sorry so women in archivists women um mm -hmm. so yeah there is this group i don't know if a member of it i guess no <laughs> because i'm not a woman in archivist but i i guess i tried um where i might be i don't know because i wanted you know to be to it's easier to find guests for me and um it's uh and i think there i mean and on the podcast actually i was thinking that i have had um more female i guess from or well, at least same number by accident but uh I have had um, also like a lot of women and archivists, uh, and um, I, th I think it's uh, I think it's uh, like I don't know. I think it's a personal interest. If you like, for example, I'm I don't think I'm I pr for sure I'm not so talented in that as uh, many other women, <laughs> and it's not about that. Um, but to go back a little bit to your personal path, um, then you manage to stay like five years at Meccano or around that time um, and see again like if I were you uh, maybe uh, knowing back in the uh, if I were younger my ego wouldn't have allowed me to be like to go back to Meccano I'll be like fuck you like I'm I'm leaving this like you now want me no uh, but you managed to to do it it was wiser most probably and how did you switch? Was your next job where you work now at uh, the company where you work now, or how did that happen? Yeah, that's correct. So, um, well, everything started very weird because uh, uh, when we uh, finished the State of Art Academy masterclass, they have Facebook page for all the students. So every time you finish, you have this like community of of people who went there. Uh, so it's easy to connect or ask questions or whatever. And then one day, uh, I think I was at work, and I check there's some guy posted that Plump Moses at that time, they're looking for uh, employees. And I was just scrolling and like, hmm, never heard of this company. And then I opened the web website. I was like, very nice visuals. Like, I, w I was actually surprised because I've never heard of them. You know, it's like it, like mirror. Everybody knows mirror, but uh, this was very, very good quality, and I've never heard this name. I was like, okay, this is weird. So I just liked them on Facebook, and that was about it. But um, I think same day or next day, I get a message from uh, Sana, uh, the uh, 
the company founder, um, and he just texted me on Facebook to chat. I was like, I saw I saw you liked our website, so I wanted to to chat. Well, what are you up to? It's like okay, so so we we chatted a bit, and I was like, but I'm really happy at Nakano. I'm not really planning switching, so I'm not not even planning to send you my CV actually. So that that was about it then, and. Uh, and then we had this huge competition in Meccano in Shenzhen. It was master plan with, uh, I don't know, two towers and uh, God knows how many buildings. And uh, it was quite a small team, I think six people or something. And I was helping them with visuals. Uh, at the end, we won this competition. So I posted it on Facebook and Sana texted me again <laughs> saying, so uh, did you do this? I was like, yeah. Did you do them alone? It's like, well, there's no one else to help me. <laughs> uh, and then he said, well, this is really cool. Maybe you want to come to chat. And actually, this was just about uh, just after I had a chat about my salary raise in Meccano, and it wasn't amazing. And I was a bit angry, like, hmm, OK, maybe I'll, I'll go to chat with those guys then. <laughs> Uh, so I went, uh, it was Saturday uh, in Amsterdam, and we just had a super nice chat with Sana and Hassan. Um, and basically they suggested me spot on a uh, job on the spot. So I had to think about it because, you know, it, it's something which is completely changing your life, you know. Uh, so I think I fought for, for a week. And then I went to talk with Francine, the CEO of Macano, and I said, you know, I really like Macano basically raised me and uh, I really appreciate for everything, you know, I had in here, but I think I want to try this new opportunity. And uh, it, she was actually very happy. She was like, you know, you, you are like my kids, so you, you should go and, you know, in case you should be welcome back, you know if you want to come back, but uh, but actually I'm really happy where I am now. So not planning to change anything in the near future. But that's nice because I was thinking about how did they receive this? Because, you know, especially after they paid for you, you know, to go to the academy masterclass. And um, from what I understood, not a lot of time afterwards you decided to leave um, um, because sometimes oh, but I, I left uh, sorry I left uh, quite after some time so it was oh, okay. more than a year like year and something because other yeah. people they left before mm. yeah because you know sometimes um, companies do okay we're going to invest in you but then you have to sign that you're not leaving in I don't know a couple of years at least or stuff like that um and i mean it's nice that they receive this not personally but as some because i don't know in my experience in the end of the day it's just business you know like yes you get connected to your company and to your colleagues and to your bosses uh but at some point i don't know you have these yearly talks i guess and uh, where you say yeah i've done this and this and this and they say like no race and then you get another opportunity and it's like the money you get affects you personally you know so like you just say i'm i don't know how do you feel about it how do you think about it because when i see yes it's nice to be in a nice environment at work but still it's like business it's like it's work you know I, I don't know. I was I was talking about this recently with someone. And for me, it's very important to be sincere. You know, like I cannot, uh, like work relationship for me is still a relationship and I have to be sincere. So if I feel that there's something wrong, I will have to say that it's something wrong. If I feel that it's something nice, I, I I would like to say that it's something nice. And uh, this is something I expect as well from the other part. So for me, this being absolutely, you know, without uh, hiding anything, 
or I don't know, lying about something or something is just out of the question. So if I feel that something is wrong at the office, I have to communicate this. And I think communication is the key in any case. No, but this is of course not what I meant. Like, um, like sometimes, uh, you know, like you communicate, you say like, I'm happy and I'm, I'm unhappy about that. Or like, you know, you communicate you, and then this communication, you know, affects your decisions. Like if you like, I don't know, have done, for example, in your case, you have done, uh, these visualizations, maybe you have won a couple of competitions, you have, you know, you generate money for this company and you of course then you want to be rewarded because it's fair and then they say like no say like i'm unhappy and in that case if you leave the company and they say like oh why are you leaving that's so bad we kind of grew up and stuff like that if they had reacted bad it's like this is what I yeah mean. No, no, i understand but I think it always has to come from uh like it always has to be said because if there's something you know you're angry about or something and you don't say and you keep it that's what feels wrong you know and uh, you know i appreciate of course i said for them that i really appreciate what they did to me but uh, at the same time you know uh, i want to grow more and actually now i do work with makan because they hire us to do a visual so once in a while so so it's you know it's con continuing relationship maybe a bit differently so yeah 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 in your case yes but i um i'm currently switching jobs so i'm planning to do one extra podcast where we discuss a little bit about this uh this topic uh, how to leave a job uh, what to expect uh, because Ah, uh, nobody tells you what to expect when you're leaving a job because I mean everybody have a f first job, and then they leave and they get surprised. Uh, or like um, when you go to a new job, what to expect? So I think it's a lot. Of, it's a huge topic, uh, especially you know, because job is also something that you're not changing that often, usually. <laughs> well, yeah. Usually, yes. Well, depends on people. Not but... my case. Not my case. But uh, now I'm really hopeful not to <laughs> to change it again in the in the next uh, in the next period of time. Um, and uh, what is what is like your um, current uh, position, so to say? Uh, what is your uh, like? Um, if we had to, if we were, if we were to have the occasion to do a day in the life of Milda. Uh, what is your work day look like? Uh, what are you uh, within your skills? What is your strong points, weak points? What you like to do? Well, basically we are 10 people and we all do exactly the same. So we are all artists. We don't do names like junior, senior. We, it, it doesn't exist in our company, you know, everyone is an artist and everyone does image from the beginning till the end. Uh, what we usually do is when we get the project, we sketch on it. So it's, it's a bit like, um, imagine you get the camera and you go around the building taking a lot of pictures. So we suggest to the client a lot of shots, which we think represents well the building or if it's not the building, something else. Uh, then the client chooses from the sketches, which he likes. But the sketches are already like done with the light, mood, people. Uh, it's a bit rough on edges, like people might not have shadows or you know contact shadows. Uh, the the clip art might be rough, but but generally it's it's it has all the elements. So the building, the the mood, uh, the story. <clears throat> if you want to say that. Um, and we send those, uh, the package uh, of sketches to the client and then the client goes through the sketches, selects few he likes and uh, and then we produce high res of the images. And um, do you have a favorite kind of uh, 
image like mood so to say or style like i don't know sunny winter dark night um uh, i don't know Ooh. favorite hard to say but um i guess because i'm from lithuania and i saw a lot of winters so i'm quite good with snow images <laughs> um the, it's just a joke at the office but uh, but generally we just try to look at the location where the project is and then we research if it has winter summers springs or autumns what type of trees are there what, uh, if it's somewhere in the desert uh, you know you can go with crazy skies so yeah we just try to represent the location uh, as as good as we can uh i i was clicking through the images that are on the on the website of uh plump the company you work at and uh, i'm curious did you participate also in the images that are uh on mars located on mars yeah uh, actually the everyone who works in our company they did it yes so how was that? We did <laughs> was uh, a lot of images for that. Was it funny to do something? I, oh, I it guess was, so cool. was a little bit different. We were we were looking at the pictures uh, at NASA pages, the real ones from Mars, and just trying to represent it as good as as it gets, you know. But it's so much fun. Like it was an awesome project for sure. But did you do like a matte painting to do the? Um... Uh, what is called the um, surrounding so to say mars the whole landscape or you yeah need, we or you we, modeled it uh we did model a bit but as well we used a lot of pictures from the rover because they were like 6k i think in in the website so so yeah it's uh, it's real mars <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Uh, it, it's um, it's exciting. It's exciting. I guess it was exciting. It's also because it's something that's also very, you know, up to date. So to say, everybody are now back into this uh, space hype and Mars hype. Um, me personally, yeah, I, I'm yeah. a big fan of Elon Musk. So um, this is how I discovered podcasts because I heard his podcast on the Joe Rogan experience. And then I discovered that podcasts are cool and it's so nice to listening to people chatting <laughs> for a couple of hours or that podcast also goes for three hours so some t more most of the time. So it's, uh, it, it's uh, really cool. Um, well, then I, I guess we covered uh, most of it. Um, I like now to try to do something... Um, as a conclusion of the podcast, something more inspiring. Uh, and I ask everybody, um, what is what is their favorite way to get inspired themselves? If they have favorite uh, movie, book, um, song, uh, or even places, because I like to say that, um, you know, sometimes I go in a museum when they're open and um, and what, just by going in a museum, you get a little bit, you know, uplifted. So if there is something for you that feels special or most like you can pick one or many <laughs> absolutely uh i think i think the best inspiration is traveling for sure like visiting uh, different countries different cultures uh, food uh, nature nature for sure um we love going to mountains is it uh, winter or summer then mountain bikes and I think being in nature is the most inspiring thing. But for sure, the, reading books, listening to podcasts, like uh, in the mornings I run, and I've noticed that uh, before I used to listen to the music when I run. And lately I'm just listening to uh, podcasts because I feel uh, I'm not pushed into the rhythm. So uh, it, it, it just goes uh, more naturally. Uh, yeah, books, music. I, I listen to a lot of music when I work because I need some um, to get into headspace different. Because sometimes when I, I listen to podcasts, I, I get concentrated onto the story too much and then 
the work goes a bit different direction. <laughs> so for work is better music. But for Run, the best podcast is also the Creative Insider. So <laughs> no, I'm joking. If like people, yes, well. if people enjoy it, uh, it's a it's a good it's a good way to spend uh, the running time. And um, last but not least, if you wanna shout out some of your uh, social media channels, uh, Facebook uh, or LinkedIn accounts, uh, where can people actually then find you after they have heard this? Well, it's just my, my name and surname, so Milda Lubenskaita on all the uh, social media. But uh, generally, I suggest to follow Plump because you can see more interesting content there. <laughs> We, I'll be putting all on the, Instagram. I'll be putting all the links in the in the description of this podcast so that people can just click and go check you and then plump and what you do there. So Milda, thank you. It was a was a pleasure. Thank you for your time, and um, I wish you a nice evening. Thank you. It was really real nice evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey friends, thank you very much for listening to this podcast. You've been amazing. Before we go, I just want to remind you that if you want to support us, you can just go on the creativeinsider.com where uh, you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter or you can follow us on our social media channels which are Instagram at TCI Podcast or the LinkedIn page, The Creative Insider. Uh, by doing this, you will have a bigger social media presence, which always looks attractive to more and more important guests. And so this is very fundamental. And if you really love what we do and you want to help us doing a better production, just click on the Patreon link below where you can support us with the wished amount of money you think it's okay for you. Uh, it's a monthly subscription, but you can cancel anytime. So thank you very much and have a good week, guys. Bye-bye.